seven and a half hours here. We'll be providing live coverage of it all, the Pope's arrival out at the Fort Simpson Airport, and then his trip down here. This is perhaps the most lasting symbol of 1984 of Fort Simpson, the giant teepee that was built here, enormous 60-foot beams supporting this teepee, that underneath there will be the altar where the Pope will perform Mass, and also will speak to those assembled here. Now, as I said, it's wet, and you can obviously gather that from this picture. Many of the people who have been out here for hours now, since early this morning, getting ready to uh, see the Pope. Where's Fort Simpson? It's at the juncture of two of the most mighty rivers of the Canadian North. The Mackenzie off there to unite a faith in the Catholic Church, the rivers that brought many of the missionaries to Canada's north uh, hundreds of years ago, and began a relationship that at times has been testy, the times will in many ways be tested again today when the Pope arrives and speaks to uh, many of the native leaders and uh, the elders from across the north who are here. Now, if you were with us throughout those 12 days in September of 1984, you'll remember this face, Sister Mary Jo Letty, who is on the editorial team of the Catholic New Times. Mary Jo was with me for uh, many of the... When we took off from Edmonton, however, there was no immediate problem. They knew there was some ground fog around, but it wasn't considered to constitute a serious problem. But as we got closer and closer to Fort Simpson, the meteorological reports coming back from the cockpit got worse and worse. And finally, we ended up circling Fort Simpson for a good, oh, I'd say half an hour to 45 minutes, waiting to see if it would lift. And uh, eventually, uh, it was no go. It was quite impossible to come in. They didn't have the radar on the ground as they have this time. And uh, I remember I was the one who was called to speak on the microphone in the cockpit to Jim Antoine, who was the chief at that time, and say that there was no way of getting in. As soon as we headed back to Yellowknife, the Pope, and I, I must say, I think everybody on the, on the plane shared with him a sense of futility, but he wasn't going to surrender to that futility. And he said, how am I getting in there? And he had people designing scenarios, you know, landing in Yellowknife and then coming back. Uh, so we landed in Yellowknife and, uh, of course, waited and waited and nothing happened. Headed for Vancouver and he said, I'm still going. And all afternoon in, in Vancouver, as the mass went on, people sat around devising scenarios. Uh, <laughs> weather reports kept coming back and uh, they were finding the things that... My recollection mm -hmm. is that it, something like this, that there's a 40% chance of getting in but also a 40% chance of getting out. And, uh, yeah. that, I'll tell you, some people are already beginning to think about that today because yes. there's no fog here now, but they're wondering, well, what, what might it be like later on in the day? And if it's, a, if it's a problem, well, the Pope will get to spend more than just five and a half hours here. Yeah, Peter, you were talking about levels of what's mm -hmm. going on here. We saw three years ago when the news came that the Pope couldn't make his trip here to Fort Simpson. And uh, now I think there's a spirit of joy here, a lot of anticipation. And this is really a remarkable scene, you know, because as you look around and you think of all the papal visits we've seen via television and the one we remember three years ago, we think of the scene in the Big O or in the Vancouver Coliseum in Toronto. And here the Pope is in this uh, marvelous meeting place of the uh, native peoples with 2,500, perhaps 3,000 of them here in attendance. And I think it's going to be one of the most remarkable sights, and the people are very happy. Here's a lady who has just come in a couple of days ago. Where are you from? From Jean Marie River. And what does this mean to, to, day mean to you? It's uh, the joyest time of my life. It's once in a lifetime you get to see the Pope, and it's great. That great northern rivers meet, the Mackenzie and the Liard. For thousands of years, this has been a traditional meeting place for native people. It was a time when they owned the land, when they made the rules. It was a time long before the whites ever saw this part of the world. That's one reason why Fort Simpson was picked as the natural meeting place to meet the Pope. The other reason is because this is where the first outsiders, the first traders, the first missionaries, and the first white government also pitched their tents. That was in the early 1800s, and since then, it has been a constant struggle for the native people. Much of their pride has been stripped away. They became the poorest of all northerners, ravaged by disease and alcoholism. The Pope's visit comes at a time when they are struggling to regain control over their lives, to regain their pride. And they are not ashamed to say that they are also looking for a strong statement from the Pope, supporting their demands for land claim settlements, aboriginal rights, and self-government. It is why Stephen Kakwe worked to bring the Pope here in 1984 and why he worked so hard to get him to return today. For all the fighting and the, uh, the struggles that we've engaged in over the years trying to get Canadians to 
to uh, recognize and respect our rights and our culture, here in, 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 a, in a few hours, we would get you know, all the uh, respect that's due to us and the recognition that's due to us by a world leader. And that's, that's what is uh, significant. The satellite equipment brought into Fort Simpson will carry the Pope's message around the world. It is also evidence of a rapidly changing north. Where is that? That's going to the airport. It's cameras. Cameras and so they, of course, are head of state. The Pope, the head of state of the Vatican. But very much that is the only role uh, a non-native leader takes in this day. Because after the meeting with Jean Sauvé, the rest of this day, the next five hours or so that the Pope spends here in Fort Simpson, is spent with Canada's native people. So an important moment now, when the Pope arrives, that meeting could also meet with the uh, Bishop of Mackenzie Fort Smith, which covers this area, in his croto, and that's in fact the Bishop will be making the point once again today when he has the opportunity meeting the Pope. But a point of contention, a point of division within the church, and we'll see it coming up again today. Just one of the many different stories that this day holds. Mary Jo? Peter, to go back again to my conversations from last night, it's amazing how firmly the, the people believe the Pope would keep his promise. They, put, they saved the altar, they saved all the gifts. Everything that was ready three years ago was put away, kept in, in safety until this moment when the Pope would return. Probably up to and including the red carpet. The red I think exactly. Roll out right they now. mentioned the red carpet <laughs> specifically. This has been saved for three years. They were firmly convinced he would keep his word. Father Dennis Murphy, you've got to be happy seeing it finally rolled out, having been on the aircraft the last time that couldn't land here. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure, a pleasure, Peter, I must say. Uh... North of Edmonton, there's the Governor General getting ready to meet the Pope. And we're just three or four hundred miles south of the Arctic Circle. So while it is cold, windy, and wet here today, that's not surprising. It could be a lot colder. <laughs> it, it, it could be snow and not rain. Or there could be fog. <laughs> or there yes. could be fog. The Governor General, Jean Sauvé, her husband, Mr. Sauvé. I should uh, point out, Peter, noticeably absent from this uh, greeting, although present on the plane, is Bill McKnight from the Department of Indian Affairs. And, the Minister of. Yes. Right. And this is a deliberate effort, I think, on the part of the people here to make a statement that this is their event. That's right, Ed. And we'll be mentioned that a number of times throughout this day. Uh, it's not because the Minister of Northern Affairs wouldn't like to be in that receiving That's line. right. Uh, there has been much discussion between Ottawa, Canada's native leaders, and the Vatican about who should be here, who should be, in fact, running the show. Mind you, we can't ignore Ottawa's involvement in this. Ottawa has supported uh, yes. the native peoples in this tour, has supported financially much uh, of this end of the tour. Um, and we cannot forget that. However, the political symbolism of the fact that it's many of the elders of Canada's native community and members of the church and the governor general, who's Nick Siviston, as you saw in the Fraser's item, uh, who are in this lineup and uh, not representatives of the federal government. So what's happening now, the uh, bishop of Mackenzie Fort Smith, Bishop Dennis Coteau, has gone up into the plane and is meeting with the Pope now and uh, along with the uh, chief of protocol and then well there they're just heading up in there now de planning at the back end of the plane and this is another uh, reason for this uh, short delay it's built into the schedule the opportunity for the media who are traveling with the pope to slip out the back of the aircraft so they can get the shots of the pope arriving here a very long line the pope will go through here at the airport and these are elders from across the Northwest Territories and across the Canadian North uh, who have come here, many who were here just over three years ago and the bitter disappointment that we've mentioned already of that day. Uh, but in a way, that's almost forgotten now. The excitement building for the moment that the Pope does arrive. In fact, I've had a couple of the natives. Here's the Pope now coming off of the aircraft. And that gesture so familiar to us from 84. A bit of a wind. And the Pope meeting the Governor General once again, as we did in 84.
Steve has just come off a very strenuous tour of the United States that's taken him across the United States and back and forth. Let's just try and eavesdrop a bit if we can here. Very difficult with those jet plane energy noise. The Governor General, of course, uh, Peter, was here yesterday. And yesterday evening there was a special event, a barbecue and a dance ceremony for her with the Native people here. Okay, we'll try once again here just to listen to this conversation. You have to listen closely, though. St. Anne in 84 and at Midland, this tremendous sense of human communication between the Pope and the people. Those of you wondering why we can't hear these conversations, one, we're really not supposed to. Uh, two, there is a great deal of uh, noise surrounding that aircraft area. And uh, the conversation is just basically uh, meeting many of the elders from the different areas that have come here. It's interesting, you know, as Mary Jo is pointing out, the way he seems to reach out and physically touch people 
and that mitigates to a great extent the sometimes stern and harsh sound of some of the things he says. Uh, I, I think that you have to not only hear what the man says, but see him in action to get some measure of what it is that he's about. There's Father Roberto Tucci on the other side of the car, the organizer of papal tours for the Vatican. Okay. He's trying to listen again, but unfortunately he can't. The Pope will now go into his... Uh, and so on. And uh, I was just reflecting the other day that, in fact, there has been a tremendously different experience of the papal visit in the United States and the papal visit in Canada. And it's quite clear to me that one of the central reasons is simply the television coverage and the amount of time that has been given to that. In the United States, in general, there has been one-hour specials in the evenings. And that immediately makes of a papal visit a news event where one singles out certain critical points. In Canada, uh, both today and in 1984, the television coverage was all inclusive. And it makes of it a very different kind of... ...for this trip than there was ready for the trip three years ago. About a third the size of the RCMP force here. Uh, but still, nevertheless, a hundred or so. They will have done all the normal precautions at the airport. I know that they went through all the gifts that are to be presented today, last night. In fact, I got a chance to stand in the jail cell where the gifts were kept last night to, uh, uh, to see some of the things that we presented the Pope. And we did see, just uh, half an hour or so ago, a couple of our CMP officers checking along the shoreline of the Mackenzie River here, uh, just to ensure that everything was uh, properly in place. So that's the scene at the airport. That was the uh, official arrival ceremonies. And as we say, the drive from there to here, the uh, TP at the mass site, about 15 minutes at the most. Now, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing here right now, because there's a, there's a significance in uh, our coverage of First Minister's conferences on Aboriginal matters. Marie Wilson is always with us then. She is perhaps the most familiar face in Canada's north as a major representative of the CBC's Northern Service. She's with us again today. Marie is in the area just in front of the giant teepee there. Marie? Hi, Peter. I want you to know the rain's letting up. It's not as hard as it was a few minutes ago. I'm here with Bertha Blondin. Bertha, you told me yesterday that you didn't care, even if the rain did come down this morning. That's right. And I'm really happy about that because I think everybody's spirit has left it quite a bit, even though there's rain or not. And I'm really happy that the, the clouds have gone up a little bit higher to make everybody feel a little bit better because they're all, I think that everyone's excited. But when you told me that yesterday, you even to talked about it in spiritual terms, that the rain served a purpose. Yes. Um, when the rain comes like this, it means a new beginning for everybody. And when I'm saying a new beginning for everybody, it means that everyone with this rain, it's cleaning out the whole land. And it's cleaning out the people, mind, body, and soul. You, in your personal life, have been involved in a great process of purification, going back to traditional ways, learning your language after having lost it, mm -hmm. studying traditional medicine and spiritual beliefs. Why is all that so important to you and to people here? Well, it's very important like for myself because um, my father taught me about a lot of spiritual ways since I was a little girl. And um, that spirituality has never left our people and still here with our people today, but they don't practice it as much as they used to because they have a new spiritual way to, to practice now. Well, you were telling me about some of the things you used to do with your dad when you were small. Yes, when, we were little, when I was a little girl, my father taught me how to pray in our spiritual way through the fire, through the water, through the sky and the earth. Thank you, Bertha. And Peter, you'll see later on, moved north in the mid-1800s, Anglicans and Roman Catholics. But Catholic institutions predominated and endured not just churches. There were orphanages, hospitals, residential mission schools, things that are normally run by government. But until the 1960s, the Northwest Territories had a long distance government based in Ottawa. So the government in the South paid the church in the North to do the job. I never knew my mother. My dad put me in a convent was a year and a half old. And we were forbidden to talk slavery in, in school. How many times I got slapped was trying to talk slavery with, my, with the girls? I got so that I hated my own language. 
our spiritual leaders and our our leaders at that time were isolated uh, by the church and uh, and uh, as everybody else were getting baptized and, and around him he they were eventually isolated isolated but not destroyed native people across canada still have their own spiritual leaders many were here in 1984 waiting in the fog with dampened spirits and dampened bodies one of them caught what he called the pope's cold and he died stanley isia never got to meet the holy man so strikingly like him in physical appearance and in spiritual conviction he had devoted seven years to translating the new testament into his dene language but he also always believed the dene have their own bible written on the land if the scriptures are on the land this has to be a most sacred page this is bare rock about 500 kilometers downstream from fort simpson you can see the dark patches surrounded by trees in local the dene savior the creator his name is really great to the people. Just like we say our creator will be for, for our legend, it's a creator for us. The details of the legend vary as much as the native dialects from one end of the Mackenzie Valley to the other. But the spiritual symbols are important enough to make up the logo of the Denny Nation central organization. Giant animals that were harming the people. The hunt that took place when the great Yamoria came to save the people and put everything in its place, and the eternal fire he left behind. But the symbols of the age-old legend are just as much symbols of a way of life that continues today. Even on the coldest, darkest days, hunting and trapping for food, clothing, and cash. Nobody gets rich but they get by. This is a long way from the man-made concrete jungle of southern cities. It is, as people here have often said, very close to God's creation. This understanding is at the heart of native spirituality, religion based on the laws of nature. Look after the land, it will provide for you. Destroy the land, it will destroy you. Man is part of nature. He does not control it. The land is there to use, not to look at. This is a homeland, not a national park. As people travel the natural highways of this land, they see the wealth around them as the Creator's gift. There are countless traditional ways of giving thanks for these gifts. This is called paying the river, in this case with tobacco. It is to ask the river for a safe journey upon it. It's been a long journey over the past couple hundred years for native people and the church, each clinging to their own spiritual path, yet opening up sooner or later to the other. Many of them have learned the native languages that young people used to be punished for speaking in mission schools. Today, there is a growing feeling that church leaders have learned them as much to listen as to talk. I see. Today, priests participate in the traditional dances they once scorned, and they acknowledge by their presence the sacred ceremonies of Native people, those who have been so willing to add the ways of the Catholic Church to their own much older ways of reaching out to a higher The weather is improving dramatically. In fact, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see it on that shot, but there is a rainbow developing right over this site. <laughs> and we talk about symbolism, I don't think we want to go too far on, on the possibilities that we could have in discussing that. But the sun could well be out within the uh, next five or ten minutes here. It's starting to clear over very quickly. As I told you before, the Mounties, the security is very low this time, but they are around. Those are two Mounties out in the boat just along the shore, just a few hundred feet from the altar site, who are just maintaining a watch uh, along the shores of the Mackenzie River. And, Right now they look like they're maintaining a watch up at the altar site with those binoculars. There's the rainbow I was talking about. You look closely there and you'll see it. That's just right, in fact, over this whole site uh, around Fort Simpson as the uh, people await. We no longer want the church to hold our hand in some dependent relationship. We want you, the church, to stand together with us in solidarity. 
for our just causes. And I think what I have heard them saying is, as you once told us, for example, you church people, to trust the government, we are now asking you to tell the government to trust us in our efforts for our own justice. All right, the Pope just minutes away from arrival here at the mass site. Time now, yeah, he's just a couple of minutes away, just checking there. Time, though, to drop down near the altar site where Larry Stout is with us again. Larry? Peter, one of the missionaries who has been ministering to these people for the last 34 years is with me. He's uh, Father Rene Fumalo. He's an oblate, and you know the oblates are very close to the people here in the Northwest Territories. Father Fumalo, just before the Pope arrives, what is it that the church is going to have to do? Gentlemen like you are getting older. Uh, there isn't a native clergy. What is the church going to have to do here if it's not going to just survive but thrive? Well, the church is all the Dene and all the people who live in the Dead Shore Valley in the Mackenzie Valley. And uh, their spirituality is still very strong. And they're very spiritual people. So I trust that uh, they're going to find their way some way in the, in the future. What it's going to be, I cannot foresee it. But I don't think that God worries as much as we do. And I trust that uh, the people have enough inner strength to uh, enough faith in Jesus Christ and in their own tradition so that they will carry on very well. Well, I don't know if it might be necessary, it might not, and it might not be the solution. There's probably many other things that should happen, you know, with or without a native clergy. Thank you very much, Father Rene Fumalo, a missionary here from Yellowknife, the Northwest Territories. Peter, the Pope is just moments away. Back to you. Thank you, Larry. This is the ceremony that begins the arrival ceremony here at the uh, mass site for Pope John Paul II. the papal motor motorcade just arriving on site. In the foreground there, in the middle of your picture, is an area called a dance circle, where many of the ceremonies last night in preparation for this day took place. It's not a part of the event today. The Pope coming along now in his motorcade along a mud road at the shores of the Mackenzie River to the site where they waited three years ago for his arrival. The fog prevented it. Today, the weather is breaking, cold, wet, and windy just an hour ago, quickly turning sunny. I wouldn't suggest warm, but sunny and not wet and not foggy. The crowd that was lining the road now rushing into the area where the Pope will conduct a walkabout. Now, this is the first function here. It'll be interesting to watch the Pope as he comes out of the limousine. Much has been said of his kissing the ground on arrival at various countries around the world, including Canada in 84. And many people have wondered what he will do when he arrives here at the homeland of the Denny. The airport could not be really construed as that. But this is, will the Pope kiss the ground or the monument that he's about to dedicate? The answer appears to be no, but it's early. Both with that familiar wave. So the crowd gathered here. Uh, a rough estimate on the crowd size. I think we can safely suggest it's in the four to five thousand neighborhood four or five times the normal size of this community. What we're seeing here now is just the leaders of both the church and the Denny community going over with the uh, Pope what is about to take place, listening to the the drums, the instrument of prayer for the native people. It was Bishop Croteau, Bishop of uh, Mackenzie area, and um, Chief Antoine, who's the chief of the Fort Simpson band. Now 
I should tell you a little about this monument, because it's very important. The symbolism here is based on tradition. You'll see Pope is now reading the plaque that was there three years ago for his dedication. And the round stone represents the beaver lodge. Without the beaver to maintain the land as it is, moose could not live. Without moose, people could not live. The dome also represents the rock used by the Denny's ancestors for tools. Either side of that rock, two drums. The Pope will now bless this monument. In Denny, first, a short line in Denny from the Pope, one of the many languages the Pope can converse in, and then in English. And the line in Denny is basically to represent his thanks for being here. The microphone being set up mm -hmm. for the Pope now, who is will be making this blessing looking out over the juncture of the Mackenzie and the Laird Rivers. First line in Denny. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Most holy one, Look upon us with your blessings as we begin this new day. We give thanks to you for these waters, for all waters, as the waters cleanse and heal and strengthen the air and the land. So too, let your flowering love cleanse and heal us. Bring us together as one people and strengthen us. Thanks to you, gentle lover, for this fire, for all home fires where offerings of love and, and kindness, understanding and caring are made. Let the fire of your spirit burn all impurity from this land and from our minds and hearts and spirits and send a pure prayer of love from this land and from each of us to you. There are four sides to this monument, and the Pope is choosing to speak from each side as part of this blessing. We give thanks to you, great spirit of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the air and her many winds. As the winds awaken and 
cares the long in spring and summer, as they prepare the land for rest and sleep in fall and winter, so too let the winds of your spirit awaken our lives so that we may always be as the seasons of your love, constant as the love in our expressions of your great creative power. We give thanks to you, Creator of all, for this land and, and all she produces, for the animals of the land and water and sky, for the plants which help us to live healthy lives, for the lives we leave it caring for this beautiful land you have given to our care. As you are the source of all good, we ask that you send the blessings of your great love to open and clean, to heal and strengthen this land these lands and her peoples in this new day. We ask that you open the way for a new future, a better future for each of us, but especially today, most holy one, we ask these blessings for these holy people you have entrusted with the caring of these lands for which we have given them. Bring them light in time of darkness, health in time of sickness, joy in time of sorrow. Teach them to listen to your voice, to live in your ways, and to, to be brothers and sisters of all. Great Spirit, our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, listen to our prayer, for you rule the universe forever and ever. Welcome. 
blessings from the Pope, including the blessing of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, there are some differences here than some of the things we'd expected. The line in Denny was not there. It may have been uttered privately. Uh, there was some hope and expectation that the Pope would kiss the rock at the monument. That did not happen. And uh, we don't want to draw too much of that yet, but there is significance in that. And there were many native leaders who were hoping that the Pope would give the uh, symbol that he is known for around the world on his travels of kissing the ground uh, at either the ground at the monument site or at the monument itself. But that hasn't happened, at least it has not happened yet. The Denny drummers at the monument now beginning their music, and once again, it will remind you that the drum is a symbol of prayer for Canada's Denny people. A spectacular picture of the Mackenzie River in the background, calm, almost still for a rushing river at this moment. The trees, many of them poplar in the background there now without their leaves. The Pope will now be presented with one of the drums by the lead drummer. spruce boughs on the ground there around that small campfire. That's Bishop Croto beside the Pope and just slipped out of camera range there for a the moment. Be back in a minute. Stephen Kakwe is the uh, post former president of the Denny Nation. a moment that unfortunately we did not see uh, where the Pope did kiss the rock. We must have been on a wider shot at that moment reacting to the crowd. Uh, but we'll get further confirmation of that. The Pope will now, after being the presentation of the drum, will begin first of all a walk, a walkabout. This could last anywhere in the neighborhood of half an hour or so. The Pope gets an opportunity to welcome the Holy Father banner there, falling over the uh, some of the crowd. It's an opportunity to personally meet, hand to hand, touching. Many of those who have gathered here today, many of them were here at the last time. There are some sad stories of especially in the case of the elders who had come so far last time and have passed away since. Uh, and we're not able to meet the Pope. But many have come back, many more here than there were here three years ago. They've come for their opportunity to meet John Paul and to listen to John Paul. Mary Jo, he made a good point a little earlier that for many of them they may have trouble understanding him. But the word will pass very quickly through this crowd and across this land as to the words the Pope uses to describe his feelings on the key issues uh, that confront Native people, not only in their quest uh, for self-government, for a land base, but key phrases and key words that will help them interpret the Pope's feelings about the relationship between them and the church. Yes, and Peter, and it's just striking me that as in many issues, um, not everybody has kept up with the various complex negotiations that these native people have been involved in. But quite simply stated, I think it is an effort on the part of native peoples in the north to fashion a new future in an area of the country that still remains somewhat undefined. And quite simply, they are trying to move from a situation of dependence, both on the federal government and in some ways on the church, to a new situation in which they can participate in this country as equals. And for them to do so, they feel they need to claim a land base and to have control or jurisdiction over what happens on that land base. Now in the recent discussions in Ottawa around the Meech Lake Accord and in various other discussions, that desire has not yet been concretized. In fact, many Native leaders would say that it has been frustrated. 
and at this point they are left without any promise of future negotiations on this desire for self-determination. The Pope, what, whatever the Pope says here today will be extremely important for them politically. And as I have said, his simple presence here says very dramatically to the rest of the country, these people are important. Notice them, look at them. Now I think we have to be very careful to remind ourselves, it is not as if the Pope is giving these people importance. They are important, they have dignity, they are very special. He is simply affirming that and acknowledging that and asking the rest of the country to do so as well. Some of the thoughts that take place today on the nature of what the Pope has to say, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine, though, that at this particular moment, as we watch what we're watching now, uh, that those thoughts are going through their minds. The very the spiritual nature of this moment and the, uh, the importance of him being here, of them being here with him, and of just simply the moment of meeting him, you know, take precedence almost over everything. Father Merkel. I think, too, one of the interesting things that we see happening now and that we heard in the uh, prayers of blessings of sort of earth, air, fire, and water is the absolute acceptance of the culture of these people and support for it. Now, for the Holy Father, that has a political ramification. For him, it's very clear that it is a culture, uh, a people, a nation that the state serves, and they determine the relationship with that state and should not have it determined for them. So what he says about the culture, his support for it, is tremendously important for his political uh, positions relative to the Aboriginal peoples as well. All right, this uh, walkabout, once again, takes, will be in the neighborhood of a half an hour. surprisingly on this this walkabout father murphy um, it, it was as we heard from mark i mean it was a grueling schedule at least on this trip through the united states but uh, and, and i sense looking at the pope comparing the look from a couple of years ago um, he gets through these schedules pretty well he, he does seem to me a little bit tired uh, but that's not surprising yeah, I thought last night I happened to catch the end of the Mass in Detroit, and uh, uh, I asked Larry Stout, I said, you know, I had never noticed a particular facial expression he seemed to have on, and Larry said, well, I, I have, and it's, uh, it's when he's tired. And when he got off the plane, I, I was fascinated by the fact that he was at the door of that aircraft, ready to go down those steps, uh, you know, before anybody expected it, and he went through that receiving line in jig time. Uh, he obviously was tired, and... Uh, what was interesting, uh, I think I mentioned to Larry last night, was that uh, when he arrived in Edmonton last time, he was he was exhausted then, and uh, it was the only time I think he sat down in the Pope Mobile. So Edmonton uh, has received a tired or exhausted Pope twice now. Peter, just to follow on what Mark has said, I think these visits are certainly opportunities for us to see the Pope, but they are also opportunities for Catholics to see each other as church. One of the striking things that I think uh, marked the American visit was that for the first time, many American Catholics realized that at least half of their church is Hispanic, and that in fact, this is the future of the church in the United States. And I think seeing these people here in the North, the people that 
many Catholics do not have the opportunity to see. Uh, will help Catholics to realize that these people are part of our church. In fact, somebody was telling me yesterday they have the highest per capita percentage of practicing Catholics in Canada among the Dene. The, we saw just a moment ago on the shot from behind the crowd looking face on into the, uh, into the Pope. Beside him, uh, to his left, our right, if you're looking on the screen, uh, Bishop Croto, who is the bishop uh, of this area. We mentioned this a little earlier, but I think it's worth discussing again. One of the concerns for the church in the north is quite simply the advancing age and the declining numbers of priests. Uh, one of the concerns that the Bishop Croto has raised is that it is time now uh, to consider married native priests. On the face of it, it seems like a statement that will never meet on receiving ears by this Pope, who has been so strong and so conservative on that issue, uh, on priests across the country or across uh, the church. Is there a way, is there a door that can be opened on this concern? Well, perhaps, Peter, just to give a bit of background, first, uh, Bishop Croto said this in a press conference two days ago that he would ask the Pope to ordain married Native men. This repeats a request made almost 10 years ago, and again at least one other time, by Bishop Alexander Carter of Sault Ste. Marie, who has begun an extensive program of training Native deacons for service among their own people. So this request has been put forth officially from the Canadian Church, or at least from two bishops. Now, I have heard it said that perhaps the only way this question will be resolved is if there is established a native right, much in the same way as Ukrainians have their own right within the Catholic Church, their own special practices, and although Ukrainians and Roman Catholics share a common belief, they have different practices and different types of disciplines that it would not be impossible to think of establishing an Indian right or a native right which would take account of their particular needs. What those two bishops are saying is that celibacy is simply not a culturally understandable reality for many native people. I'd also suggest that another uh, cultural reality which is somewhat difficult for them to exercise within the church at this moment is that most of their decisions are made through consensus as we see in the Northwest Territorial Government. So that would be another area where there would need to be some cultural accommodation. Dennis, do you see, see any possibilities there? I really, I think I'd have to say, Peter, that at this time, that, that this Holy Father, at least at the present moment in his pontificate, is committed to less pluralism rather than more pluralism. And uh, Mary Jo's idea uh, is, is a way in which it can be done. But I'd have to ask myself whether or not uh, the introduction of another rite this time uh, with the Holy Father, who is, I think, relatively unhappy with uh, too much pluralism. He uh, comes from a background that seems to demand uh, uh, a greater solidarity and many kind of opinions. And uh, and so I, I'd wonder at least whether that's possible. All right. One of clearly the discussions and the debates that's going on within the church and within the native community that is of concern to them. The other concern, and you're going to see it expressed here in a few minutes after the walkabout, it'll take place inside this giant teepee where some of the leaders of the native community will have a private audience with the Pope. There's three of them who you know if you've ever watched any of our First Minister's conferences uh, in the past that deal with uh, native issues. On your right on the screen, Smokey Briere, Louis Briere is the president of the Native Council of Canada. In the middle, George Erasmus, the uh, president of the Assembly of First Nations. And uh, next to George is uh, Jimmy Sinclair, the president of the Métis Council of Canada, who has uh, given some of the most dramatic, emotional uh, speeches at those conferences. I think if you saw the last one when the process broke down, uh, Jimmy Sinclair went around that table uh, and, and had very specific things to say 
uh, about some of the uh, government leaders in this country and the inability of all of those around the table, and that included the native leaders, to come to an agreement that would provide self-government for the uh, native people. Just solidarity through this whole process to the point where at the last round of talks they presented a very united voice to the government. I was also thinking that I had heard Jimmy Sinclair quoted as saying that the Pope understands Métis and Native issues better than many Canadian cabinet ministers. That's his assessment of the situation. And he doesn't say that lightly. He's a man who's met yeah. the Pope five times. Mm -hmm. And uh, for all of us who've watched Jim Sinclair, uh, he doesn't take long about getting to the heart of the issue that's on his mind. Yes. He doesn't spend a lot of time dealing with the pleasantries. He wants to get right to the issue. Mm -hmm. And um, so when he says that, uh, you know, he means it. We should mention, by the way, we're going to see this later on today, but we see that just the back of it, the special papal chair that was ready three years ago, so much of this area was, for the Pope's visit then. That's it on the right of the screen. We're just zooming into it now there. Uh, it's very representative of the north. The uh, main structure is built around moose antlers, which the significance, of course, they've been used for centuries here in the making of tools and weapons. They're the main structure of the chair. Uh, moose hide is in the back there. The cushion is made out of, we can't quite see it in here, unfortunately. The cushion is made out of beaver pelt. Um, there are flowers, crosses carved into the uh, different parts of the papal chair, both the, uh, the antlers there and in the uh, tanning of it. Peter, this uh, moose hide uh, has a lot of significance on many levels. It certainly has a lot of meaning for the native people. It also, I think, is a statement to the various groups in Europe and elsewhere that are upholding animal rights and who have criticized the native people for their uh, killing of the animals in the north. Steve Katfui has made a statement on that and tried to explain to people how the native people understand their relationship to the animals. He said that we view ourselves as part of the natural world. We know there is no humane death in nature and that many animals die of disease or starvation. We are appalled to see how animals are treated in cities, how they are enclosed in cages and so on. And he says that the greatest threat to animals is not hunting or trapping, but the damage done to the environment through various uh, mega projects in the north so he calls on people to understand the intimate relationship which his people have with the land and with the animals on that land you know it's uh, fascinating in the, the bit of time we've had up here before the pope arrived to talk to some of the, uh, the native leaders about their expectations of the speech and one of the uh, concerns is this animal rights concern. Well, I mean, we've heard from various leaders. One, we want to hear a strong statement on the Meech Lake Accord, or we want to hear a strong statement about renewing the process of discussions at the First Minister's level on self-government. Or, we don't want to hear anything. We just want to be here. That's a statement enough to the concerns of people like Steve Packley, who, to the major issue to him in, in some of these areas, is the question of animal rights. You mentioned the significance of the fact he will be sitting in this chair and what it's made of. It's also significant to note that in, among the many dozens, literally dozens of gifts that the Pope has accepted, uh, lies a huge pair of mitts made out of uh, the fur from the beaver. The, well, uh, it's, a, it's an extremely serious economic question, as many people here have noted, and the people are suffering enormously uh, from what amounts to a virtual boycott on the fur trade, and they find it difficult to understand because they feel that the Europeans who started this fur trade and began to trade with the Indians for fur now seem to be having a case of bad conscience. And of course, as the Native people will explain, for them it's not simply hunting for furs. It, there's a whole um, way of life involved with that and, and it also involves food and many other dimensions of their lives. I think you're suggesting uh, that uh, it well may be that on the issue of uh, fur trapping, that
that uh, it'll be in the symbols that we see rather than anything the Holy Father says and that seat you describe and the gifts that are given to him. Oh, I think he already has received, if my memory serves me correctly, the uh, beaver stole, which the native peoples originally tended to give to him in 84, and I think they brought that over to him on one of their visits. Uh, so he's received that, and that's highly symbolic, and I think it's read by people as being his acceptance of their claim that to prevent them uh, from doing this is to attack their economic basis. It's a kind of economic genocide, almost. I think it's uh, worth mentioning for those who might be listening, saying, well, it's just a gift. Uh, what fuss can be caused by that? We don't have to think back too far to the kind of fuss that can be caused uh, by a gift of, uh, of fur. We saw it just south of here in Alberta a couple months ago when uh, when the Sarah Ferguson Prince Andrew, the Duke and Duchess of York, were in Canada and the controversy surrounding the presentation by the Alberta government of a fur coat. Uh, the controversy mainly centered in uh, Britain. But as you suggest, the Pope uh, has been presented and accepted in the past, so his statement uh, is clear in accepting of of the furs and once again here today. Different situation governing the two stories, but nevertheless, uh, the kind of controversy that can be drawn surrounding it, uh, I think, is clear. Now, I think Marie Wilson is standing by, uh, and, and Marie, you have some thoughts on this particular discussion that we're having now on the, basically the animal rights discussion. Marie? Uh, well, actually, Peter, I I'm have sorry. with me Jerry Cheesy, who is a former chief of the Denon Nation. He now works in negotiations for the land claims. And we were going to talk a bit about what the expectations of the Pope's address are today, but I think the animal rights issue figures into that as well. Uh, Jerry Cheesy, he gave a message last time saying that Aboriginal people should have a right to a land base, should have self-determination. Is the expectation that he will go farther than that this time? I'm not sure, Marie. I think basically the people here expect maybe two messages. One, mostly on the spiritual level, which is a lot of the elders have traveled many miles to hear him talk. I think the native leaders here of, from various uh, provinces representing different Aboriginal groups expect uh, a political message. I think that message probably have many aspects of it. Of course, the last time that he, uh, he uh, was supposed to have arrived here, he talked about many things, uh, constitutional matters, which affects all Native people. I think uh, animal rights issues are a great part of that because, as you know, Aboriginal people rely on hunting, fishing, trapping. Uh, the constitutional talks process has broken down, has ended. And the other is that there has been a great growth in the animal rights movement, which has been detrimental to Aboriginal trappers and hunters. Those are two things that he could perhaps add to what he has already said in 84. Well, that's true, Marie. I think uh, what you say about the animal rights movement definitely is a fact. I think uh, the Pope realizes that as being a really important issue that has to be addressed not only by himself but also by the uh, Canadian government. Uh, I think he will address it. There are a lot of people here who say it's not just the political, that you cannot separate the political issues and the spiritual issues, that the traditional spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal people are based on a land and a way of life. That's true. I think uh, if you look at the elders here today, you could really clearly understand that uh, they can't be separated. Although um, when you deal with, with government bureaucrats, uh, things aren't as simple as that. They like to separate things into little nice, neat categories for their own benefit and not looking to what kinds of uh, benefits that the Native people would receive through a, a probably a just land claim as in the Northwest Territories. Mr. Cheesy, thank you very much. You can see, Peter, an expectation that the Pope will somehow see the bigger picture in a way that the federal government has not always been able to see it. All right, Marie, it'll be uh, interesting to see how he reacts to what the native leaders, as you see inside the uh, teepees, suggest to him before his remarks. And uh, let's be perfectly frank about this. The Pope arrives here with remarks already prepared, that he has approved, that he has worked out, that the, everybody's had an input on these, on these remarks. Canada's native leaders have sent drafts to the Vatican of what they would like to hear. Uh, Ottawa has had influence in trying to uh, suggest what 
their position is and what they'd like to hear. The church, the Canadian church, has its own views on all this as well. Those are all melded together into a speech. But what is important to note here is that before the Pope gives the remarks that have been prepared, he is in a private audience with Canada's native leaders. One of them told me yesterday, Peter, you got to understand how crucial this moment is. The uh, political advice we've had is that this Pope listens, that this Pope can, at the last minute, add a line, change a line, change a word, add a word, and a new word or a dropped word can be crucial to people's understanding and interpretation of what he has to say. And as this gentleman said to me yesterday, this is our last chance, and we're going to give it all we got in those final 15 minutes to try and influence the remarks that the Pope uh, has to make. Father Murphy, you want to make a point on that? I was simply going to comment to, uh, on the fact that he's meeting with the leaders of uh, the various churches in Canada who are supportive of Project North. And uh, I thought that that was a fine part of the program, uh, that uh, he would have an opportunity to meet with those different uh, church leaders uh, to express for the people of Canada, I think, uh, and uh, perhaps on an international stage, and this all of the Christian churches in Canada and other people in Project North as well who support the Native people and their aspirations. Yes, Project North is a, an inter-church coalition started in 1975, largely around the Berger Commission inquiry up and down the Mackenzie Valley pipeline. One of their major mandates was to communicate the uh, concerns of the North to the people of the South. They've done that extremely effectively for 10 years and on an ecumenical basis and I think are widely respected by the Native leaders for their efforts in this area. Project North was also very instrumental in developing the church's position around the time of the constitutional discussions this spring and the Meech Lake Accord. Uh, the draft that they developed is called uh, a, the New Covenant. And in that paper, which all of these church people have supported, the major church leaders, they advocate that Canada enter into a new covenant with the Native people. That the old covenant is seriously flawed, that a new covenant needs to be constructed whereby Canada's original peoples can enter into the Canadian Confederation as equals. All right, that's good backgrounding to the New Covenant because if he mentions that in his speech, then we know what we're talking about. The, uh, the Pope now entering this giant TP. Uh, it was constructed three years ago for this moment. It now takes on uh, the role that it had been planned for three years ago, but perhaps an even greater, significantly greater role this year. This meeting and the remarks the Pope makes after it uh, awaited with a great deal uh, of expectation by the people inside the TV right now and by the people, of course, here on site and those across uh, Canada's north and, for that matter, Canada's native population throughout the country uh, to hear what the Pope's saying. Meeting now, shaking hands with Smokey Briere. Uh, should make a point that uh, these, <laughs> in many cases, uh, as we mentioned,